look at some of the um, trends in hardware. So please welcome Hugo Elias from the Shadow Robot Company. Hi everyone, my name is Hugo Elias. I'm from the Shadow Robot Company. Um, I thought I'd just, uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about how robots are going to affect uh, business in the future. Um, I think if there ever was a full Zerin, it would be trying to predict the future, especially of, um, especially of the way robots are going to affect every part of our society. Um, or even predict how to get the next slide. Okay. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about, about my, my history. Um, I've been working in robotics now for 22 years, since I was 14. Um, through a network of friends, I met, I met someone in Islington who was a photographer, a guy named Richard Greenhill. Um, he had a dream that one day he was going to build a human, a sort of home service robot that was going to do all of his washing and all of his cleaning, and he had a huge pile of washing at home ready to go. Um, he was building it in an attic with some friends of his, and he said, I must come along and, um, and help. So um, we used to go and find bits of wood in skips and electronics at junk shops, and um, I spent every Wednesday after school for the next several years trying to build an arm for this thing. Um, Eventually, Honda turned up and said, look, we've done the P3 robot, and then eventually Asimo, and um, all, this, all this work is completely useless that you've done. So we decided to move on instead um, to robot hands, which we figured no one else was doing, and robots would need to have in the future if, uh, if they were going to do any kind of useful practical applications in our homes. Um, our homes are designed to work around human, human scale and human shape things. We have cups and scissors and door handles. Every robot's probably going to have to interact with existing objects rather than having everything magnetic or with a special clip on it. Um, so we designed a human hand that was as close as possible to, to, in fact, my hand, since of the two people that worked on it, I had the fattest fingers. So it gave us the most space for electronics. Um, this, as far as we know, is pretty much the most advanced hand in the world, certainly in terms of the number of actuators it has and the number of sensors. We have 250 sensors on some versions. Um, and a total of 20 degrees of freedom. When we first started, we were advised pretty much that we'd sell maybe three of these hands. There was a market for three. Perhaps three universities in the world could afford one of these. Um, since then, we've sold 40. So um, it's been much more successful than we ever imagined. Uh, I thought I'd very quickly just touch on what do we mean by robots. Um, it's a rather contentious um, definition. Um, it's one of those things that, you know, it's hard to define, but you kind of know one when you see one. Um, there are things over there on the, the far right of the spectrum we define as definitely a robot. On the far left, probably not a robot. Uh, if you were to look in a dictionary, you would see some kind of simple-minded definition, uh, a machine that looks a bit like a person and does things you know, controlled by a computer. Um, it's trivial to think of examples that do or don't fit this that we would or wouldn't define as robots. Uh, I prefer the Wikipedia definition, partly because I wrote it, um, the key point here is that it's an agent, a machine that gives us a sense that it has agency of its own, is something we tend to call a robot. And agency can come from the way a robot thinks about and perceives the world, or the way a robot looks to us. So, um, just flicking back up here a second. Crichton over here clearly has a sense of agency. He's looking at us, he's making decisions about the world, he makes smart comments to people. Um, a car doesn't have much sense of physical agency. We don't, we don't see a face in it, but it, we know that it's making decisions about the world. Uh, and a dishwasher has neither a face nor really the ability to make decisions, so we don't call it a robot. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about really the difference between robots of the past, I'm talking industrial robots here. What can we learn from those? Well, really very little. There's no difference particularly between an industrial robot and, say, a loom that makes cloth. Um, these are just more and more complex type of automation that we've seen um, in the past. A whole new generation of robots is coming that, um, as the previous two speakers have talked about, uh, will be making decisions for themselves, interacting in human environments, and, uh, and have a sense of proper agency of their own. <clears throat> like computers do. When I was starting this presentation, I started collecting loads of slides like this, you know, graphs showing the size of the market and how it's going to change in the future and all kinds of various projections. Um, ahoy there, Captain Obvious. Okay, 
the size of the robot market is going to be increasing exponentially uh, over the next few decades. There's pretty much nothing that I can tell you here that's new. Um, <clears throat> if you didn't already know that the size of the robot market is going to be increasing, then you shouldn't be in business. Um, what I think I'd rather do is to look at the trends um, that are going to be developing the robot markets in the future. Uh, I really want to split this up into two, two major categories. We've got the drivers of the robot market. These are problems that we have that we think robots either will be able to solve better than the solutions we have now, or problems we have that only robots are going to be able to solve. And then there are the enablers, solutions to other problems that um, will feed back into robotics and make robotics easier, and also changes in society that enable us to put robots in situations that we didn't have them before. Um, an example of enabler might be the mobile phone industry. Um, this has driven the market for smaller, lower cost electronics that's made it possible to fit the electronics into the very confined space of our hand, for example. <clears throat> so the probably one of the most important drivers we have, I'm sure you've all heard about it, is the aging population. So this is the population um, distribution for Japan. Uh, 1950, you can see you've got a fairly typical population, lots of young people, and not very old, not many old people. Um, this is a good situation here. Every old and infirm person, every five old and infirm person, people probably could have one young person to look after them. That's a great situation. Now we've got the middle graph, there's a fairly even balance between the young and old. Um, and in just 41 years, they predict that we're going to be looking at that. That is almost a disaster. Here you've got a very, very large number of old people. Not only the people, say, above 85 and uh, up to 100, who are going to need a lot of looking after. You've also got a huge population of over 65-year-olds who are probably not going to be working and a shrinking population of working age people. The over 65 year olds are still gonna to want to eat even though they're not working. So these very small number of young people are gonna to have to do much more with much less to be able to support the entire population of Japan. Um, this sort of pattern is seen across the world in most developing countries. Um, so for me, this is, this is the single most important driver of robotics. Uh, the second driver, we've already seen this slide, manufacturing, of course. Um, over the last few decades, we've obviously had a trend of offshoring. All our manufacturing has been shipped over to China um, and the Far East. Um, we're slowly seeing some of that come back now. Uh, and one of the reasons is that we've now got automation, which means that a single factory worker can look after a, a team of robots um, and they can do more with less. So that's the phrase you're going to be hearing a lot. Um, I think there's a common misconception that robotic automation automatically means the loss of jobs. But I think we should all know by now that that's just not the case. This, the same thing's been predicted with the introduction of the loom, uh, the computer, etc. cetera. Um, we're certainly not all out of work now. Um, if anything, I feel like we're more busy now than we ever were before computers. Um, what's happening, of course, is not that those jobs have gone and then we're just sitting around idle, a whole new suite of jobs appears. Um, now we've got things like social media consultant, um, something that never, never existed in 1900. I think it's probably not worth talking about this. Uh, the previous two speakers have talked about how robots are going to be working in a, a very flexible, changing environment. Um, we're going to need to understand the world. The main enabler, I think, of robotics is the massive increase in computing power we've seen um, over the last few decades. I think by now I'm pretty much happy with the amount of computing power I've got on my desk. I can watch a high definition video, I can play a pretty fantastic video game, I can talk to people all over the world. If someone said to me, you know, I've got another computer that's got four times the power, or 16, or a million times the power, I'm going to go, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Robots know what they Robots desperately, desperately need a vast increase in computing power. I think that's probably going to be the one of the most important drives of, of that. Um, so computing power enables robots, and robots drive the computing power. Um, driver, driverless cars. So I think this, 
rather than talking about specific, specific changes that you're going to see in your business, I think I want to follow one type of robot and see where it goes and see the types of things we might see changing not only in business but in our society. Um, this is one of the most um, serious robots that we're going to see coming very, very soon. This is pretty much on the verge of happening now. Uh, we've, got, we've already got cars that can park themselves. In the next couple of years, we're going to have cars that can drive in slow traffic without any interaction. Um, by 2018, Google reckon they're going to release their driverless technology and I guess make it available to the public for full speed driving to work. Um, so by 2020, there should be quite a few companies, BMW, Audi, General Motors, all with their own driverless cars. So if a typical car lasts about 20 years, then by 2040, every car has been manufactured in the age of driverless cars. And so you can expect to see perhaps most cars being driverless. 20 years after that, perhaps all cars will be driverless. Um, what, does that, what does that mean? What kind of um, far-reaching implications have we got for that? Um, of course, one of the first things you can imagine is that there'll be a, a lot fewer accidents. Hopefully, driverless cars will um, be written, will have the software written to certain standards. Um, they'll always maintain a safe speed. They won't be drunk. I think we'll, what we'll also see is a vast increase in the number of driverless taxis. Now that you don't have to have a person driving a taxi, a taxi can be very cheap. And we'll start to see fewer and fewer people owning their own cars and more people just walking onto the street, flagging down one of the many, many driverless taxis hopping in it, single person, having a doze on the way to work. Um, at some point, perhaps in the future, we'll see almost nobody having their own cars. Perhaps all cars on the road will be driverless um, and taxis. Um, at that point, there will be much fewer cars on the road, because if you imagine your car is used perhaps 5% of its life, it sits on the road littering the city, uh, cramming up the pavement. Um, so if you reduce the number of cars in a city by maybe 80%, um, we can now start moving away from the kind of Los Angeles car-centric environment to a much more European-centric, um, smaller-scale city uh, that's much more pleasant for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, when all cars are driverless, I can imagine you won't need traffic lights anymore. <clears throat> I wish I could show you this video. I didn't realize we could play videos here. So I've got so many I want to show you, but when this plays, cars stream through the junction in all directions, carefully avoiding each other and slowing down and steering um, without the need for any traffic lights. Pedestrians can walk across the road knowing that they're perfectly safe. No cars are going to hit them. Um, cars will just stream past them. and It's, it's like working in the matrix. Um, what changes can we see for business? Well, it'll become very difficult, I think, to get insurance to drive your own car. Um, and because there'll be no accidents, there'll be no ambulance chasing lawyers. Um, transporting goods, if you're a small business, would be very easy. Just run into the road, give a car your box of stuff, say, take it to, uh, take it to the factory, and off it goes. Uh, I think that'll kind of to make it easier for small businesses to compete with large businesses with their um, very powerful transport infrastructure. Um, this is just really to illustrate the, um, the way that automation doesn't really affect the number of people in work. Um, we can see in 1800, the, mo the, the vast majority of people were involved with farming. Um, since farm automation came along, now apparently no people work in farming. Um, but yet we're not all unemployed farmers. <clears throat> um, a huge number of new jobs have been created. Um, now that, now that we have more automation, we can support a larger creative class of people. We need to have more ballerinas and more low budget independent filmmakers. Um, so it's not all bad news. Um, one of the things I thought I was gonna be the first person to suggest, but in fact, you talked about it already. <laughs> um, let me just rewind a little bit. A good place to learn, I think, about the way robotics is going to take us is perhaps to look at another recent technology that's changed all our lives, which is the internet. What sort of things have we seen on the internet and what can we learn from that? 
until Netflix came along, I think most of the internet was spam. Um, so clearly there's a huge market for spam, well, advertising. Um, of course, spam is cheap and robots are not cheap, but the budgets for advertising are enormous and advertisers are always looking for ways to attract our attention in a very, very busy environment. Um, we already have humans holding adverts. Um, it's a pretty degrading job. And I'm sure that at some point we're going to have robots holding adverts. I don't know if any of you have read a book by Jeff Noon called Information. Um, in, in that book, the Manchester of the future was sort of clouded with these things called blurb flyers, which would buzz around your head, urging you to buy lottery tickets and all those kind of things. Um, it's very possible we're going to have a horrible world of quadcopters always buzzing around you, trying to, trying to sell you things. Um, and hopefully we'll have some kind of laws against that. Um, now what's the other thing they have on the internet? Oh, porn. OK. Sex robots. Why does this never turn up on the graphs of the trends of robots in the future? Um, I think probably because the technology isn't there yet. Um, this monstrosity was probably found somewhere over, under a bridge over the Uncanny Valley near um, Hiroshi Ishiguro's lab in Japan. Um, of course, the technology for fully humanoid sex robots doesn't exist yet. But don't forget, there's a whole spectrum out there of, um, of robots. This is a project I worked on a while ago. It's barely a robot. Okay, It's certainly benefited from robotic technologies. It's a, a sex toy, um, but it has a, you know, closed loop feedback position control inside it. It has a computer, it has a user interface, and it can learn. As the user uses it, it learns the types of things you like to do with it. Um, and it can tailor your experience to produce a more satisfying result. And uh, from the reviews on the website, apparently that does work. Um, as society changes, though, we're going to see that becoming an enabler of this kind of thing. We've already now got several sex shops in Oxford Street. That's becoming more normal. They used to be hidden away in Soho, but now it's, it's quite a normal thing to have. Um, so I think, you know, even though now we cringe at the idea of this and we think, oh, God, only weirdos are going to be doing that. Um, there's almost certainly a monstrously large market for this. Um, apparently, the, the global market for prostitution is $190 billion a year. So um, in most countries, it's illegal. Um, and yet, the business manages to carry on. So clearly, there's a huge demand for something like sex robots. Um, and as society progresses, I think we're going to see that becoming less and less um, backstreet and more and more mainstream. Um, I remember when, about 10 years ago, I was probably the only person I knew who'd ever used an internet dating site. And whenever I mentioned this to my single friends, they would say, oh, God, that's only for weirdos and freaks like you. Um, and now I think practically everybody I know has tried internet dating. Um, so I think that's a good trend there. Um, so we're going to see that becoming really quite a normal thing. Thank you.